Good morning. I am Dr. Michael Adam Makino, a resident physician at the Southern Philippines Medical Center, Institute of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine. This morning, we will talk about suicide prevention. Suicide is a major health problem. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 700,000 people die by suicide every year. Furthermore, for each suicide, there are more than 20 suicide attempts. It is the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds globally. Suicides and suicide attempts have a ripple effect that impacts on families, friends, colleagues, communities, and societies. Suicides are actually preventable. Much can be done to prevent suicide at the individual, community, and the national levels. But why does this happen? What drives so many individuals to take down their own lives? To those who are not in the grips of suicidal depression and despair, it is difficult to understand what drives so many individuals to take their own lives. But a suicidal person is in so much pain that they can see no other option. Suicide is a desperate attempt to escape suffering that has become unbearable. They are blinded by feelings of self-loathing, hopelessness, and isolation. A suicidal person can see any way of finding relief except through death. But despite their desire for the pain to stop, most suicidal people are deeply conflicted about ending their own lives. They wish there is an alternative to suicide, but they just can't see one. This can happen to anyone. Suicidal thoughts can strike to anyone at any age, irrespective of gender or background. Suicide is often the product of an unresolved mental health issue. Suicidal thoughts, while frequent, should not be taken lightly and frequently signal the presence of a more serious problem. Thousands of people commit suicide each year, leaving family and friends to cope with the tragedy of their deaths. Family and friends who have been devastated by a suicide death are frequently kept in the dark. The shame and stigma prohibit them from speaking publicly all too very often. So who are at risk for suicide? While the link between suicide and mental disorders, such as depression and alcohol disorders, are well established in some countries, many suicides happen impulsively in the moments of crisis when they have a breakdown in their ability to deal with the stresses of their lives. This could be financial problems, relationship breakups, chronic pain, and illnesses. In addition, those who are experiencing conflicts, disaster, violence, abuse, or loss, and a sense of isolation are strongly associated with suicidal behavior. Suicide rates are also high amongst vulnerable groups who experience discrimination. These are refugees, migrants, indigenous people, the LGBTI community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and the intersex, and also among prisoners. By far, the strongest risk factor for suicide is a previous suicide attempt. So among age groups, among 15 to 34 year olds, suicide attempts are more common. There is one completed suicide for every 100 to 200 attempts. Risk factors involve depression, alcohol, drug abuse, disruptive behaviors, and a previous suicide attempt. Among the elderly population, there is a higher lethality for suicide. They complete one suicide for every four attempts. Risk factors include a high, having a higher prevalence for depression. They are more socially isolated. They make fewer attempts per completed suicide, and they use more lethal methods. For the population at risk, or among the race and ethnicity, in Asia, it has the highest rate of suicides among the world, about 60%. In the Western world, because they have more access to firearms, most suicides are committed by gunshots. In Asia, Suicides are most often committed by pesticide ingestion, charcoal burning, and self-immolation, or setting oneself on fire. 
Caucasian males have a higher rate of suicide in later life. Asian females have a higher rate of suicide after the age of 80 years old. 90% of completed suicide have been diagnosed with a major psychiatric disorders. These could be mood disorders, substance-related disorders, psychotic disorders, and personality disorders. Among the genders, men have the highest rate of completed suicides because they tend to be more aggressive and daring in their means of suicide. This can be through hanging, firearms, or jumping from a tall height. Women, on the other hand, have the highest lifetime rate of suicide attempts. This could be through self-poisoning, overdose with medications, or slashing their wrists. Persons who are experiencing anxiety or those who have feelings of hopelessness in their lives or are suffering from shame, worthlessness, and self-esteem also are at risk for suicide. Those people who have access to firearms or those with a mood disorder such as major depression or bipolar disorders, to those who are intoxicated by drugs or alcohol or have an acutely lethal profile, and those who are experiencing loss of a loved one having relationship conflicts such as rejection, those with legal issues, economic difficulties, or having a lack of social support are also at risk. Those with a childhood trauma can lead to a development of complex and incapacitating disorders such as dissociative disorders, personality, eating, substance use, and PTSD. They can also have severe impulsivity, mood liability, self-injurious behavior. Also, those with a family history of suicide, especially among uh, first-degree relatives, and those with physical illnesses, or persons who have chronic or long-term illnesses, such as cancer, ulcers, lung disorders, HIV or AIDS, Huntington's disease, brain injury, multiple sclerosis, lupus, those who are on hemodialysis or seizure disorders. So how do we recognize if someone is suicidal? Number one is to recognize the signs. It is important to recognize the signs, the warning signs of someone who may commit suicide. These signs could be threats or comments about killing themselves, or maybe they've discussed suicide in the past as a way out. They might express how they feel that they have no reason to go on living, or they may be talking or writing about death. They could also be giving away items or making a will or changes to their will. They may obtain a weapon. However, the mere act of obtaining a weapon doesn't mean that someone is suicidal. But it, if it is paired with the other signs, then that is a warning sign. The strange sleeping patterns. This can happen when a person is experiencing stress and personal problems that causes them overthinking and inability to sleep at night. And because of this, they may have low energy, which also happens in depression. They also have a low motivation to do activities or work. Persons who are abusing drugs or alcohol. Depressed people may turn to alcohol as a form of escape or to give them enough willpower to commit suicide. They may also avoid activities that they used to love. This may include social withdrawal and sudden isolation. They may also have self-harming behaviors. They test the waters to see if they have what it takes to complete a suicide attempt. Self-harmers say that it helps them escape from, emo from the emotional pain. They may also have risky behavior. This can be aggressive behavior, impulsive or reckless behavior. They have repeated suicide attempts. They have suicidal tendencies. They may even stop their medications, which may lead to another suicide attempt. Finally, they have a lack of happiness and calm. This one is hard to spot. It may seem that the person is doing better, but one misconception about suicide is that people commit suicide at their lowest point. This is not true. But what happens after this stage is that the person is unwilling to do anything. They are at such a low point in their lives that they are unwilling to eat, watch TV, or do anything, even their favorite activities. 
they spend their days mostly in bed. If you can recognize many of these signs, then you have a sure feeling of the person of being suicidal. There are also tests to see if someone is really suicidal. Here are some examples. The patient safety screener test is a brief screening tool to detect suicide risk in all patients presenting to acute care settings. Providers can administer this test and, and identify patients at risk for suicide. We also have the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which is a measure used to identify and assess individuals at risk for suicide. It can also be completed as a self-report measure. There are also some factors that help prevent someone from committing suicide. These include those with a positive therapeutic relationship, those with religious prohibition, or whose religious faith strongly opposes suicide. If the person is pregnant, those with good psychosocial support, having strong social ties with their loved ones, those with a sense of responsibility to their family, especially to those who have children, those who are enjoying a full-time employment, those people who have positive coping skills, where they can ultimately find ways of looking at their problems in a positive way and dealing with them, those who are flexible in managing aspects of their life, in work, family, and the stresses of life, and those with the ability to cite reasons for living and optimism. So what should you do if someone you know is suicidal? Maybe you have a loved one you are worried about. Maybe you have a gut feeling that someone is thinking about suicide. And maybe you just don't know how, how to approach them or what to say to them. Should you even mention suicide? Or maybe that could make it worse. Suicidal thoughts are something many individuals go through. Yet many feels unsure of whether or not they should bring it up. But according to research, it's better to talk to someone who is contemplating suicide about suicide itself. It is better to do something than to simply ignore or change the subject. Among the facts, among the myths, and to correct this with the facts, is that talking about suicide will lead to and encourage suicide. However, this is false. Research suggests that talking about suicide may reduce suicidal ideation. It can improve mental health-related outcomes and the likelihood that the person would seek treatment. Simply talking about suicide can relieve some of the ways the victim is experiencing. It gives the individual a chance to be heard and to see that someone actually cares about them. So the main takeaway here is to reach out Talk to someone who you think may be considering suicide because deep down, they may be looking for help, but they just may be too afraid to ask for it. You can offer that help by supporting them. And if, they, if you suspect or believe that a person is in an immediate risk of suicide, the best thing to do is to stay with them and make sure they are safe. Until you can get further help, you can contact mental health professionals or emergency services. Here is one such emergency services that can be contacted. We have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is the Manila Lifeline Center. They have a telephone landline and also a mobile phone uh, hotline. We also have here in Davao, in a space like BBM, our teleconsult lines, which are available. So what are the strategies to prevent suicide? First is we create protective environments. This means reducing access to lethal means among persons at risk of suicide. Means of suicide such as firearms, hanging or suffocation, or jumping from heights provide little opportunity for rescue and as such have a high case fatality rates. So what we do is we intervene at suicide hotspots or places where suicides may take place easily. This includes tall structures such as bridges, cliffs, balconies, or rooftops. 
efforts to prevent suicide at these locations include putting up barriers or limiting access of the individual uh, to prevent them from jumping and installing signs and telephones to encourage individuals who are considering suicide and to seek help. Second is safe storage practices. This means safe storage, safe storage of medications, firearms, and other household products. These can be medications, detergents, ropes, uh, wires, and other such that can be used to commit suicide. And finally, remove any harmful items out of the room, including sharp objects such as knives, drugs, cleaning products, wires, cords, belts, or ropes. Second is to identify and support people at risk. Crisis intervention. So these approaches provide support and referral services, typically by connecting a person in crisis or a friend or family member of someone at risk to a trained volunteer or professional staff via telephone hotline, online chat, text messaging, or in person. Crisis intervention approaches are intended to impact key risk factors for suicide, including feelings of depression, hopelessness, subsequent mental health care utilization. Crisis interventions can put space or time between an individual who may be considering suicide and harmful behavior. So we establish therapeutic alliance. We can do this by practicing empathy, and demonstrating the, an understanding of the societal individual. Next is to provide them with treatment. This can be medications, which can be life-saving, not only in the long term, but also in the short term. Individuals at high risk for suicide must be monitored closely or could be hospitalized until the crisis resolves. So treatment for people at risk for suicide can include various forms of psychotherapy delivered by healthcare providers to help individuals with these mental health issues and other suicide risk factors with problem solving and emotional regulation. This treatment usually take place in a one-on-one -on -one or group format between the patients and the clinicians and can vary in duration. Next is we promote connectedness among individuals and within communities through modeling peer norms and enhancing community engagement activities. These programs involve, uh, involve individuals to participate in a range of activities, including religious activities, community cleanup and greening activities, and group physicals, physical exercise. As these approaches typically target youth, and are also delivered in school settings and other environment settings and can help in reducing risk factors for suicide. Next is we have teach coping and problem solving skills. This can mean parenting skills and family relationship programs. These provide caregivers with support and are designed to strengthen parenting skills, enhance positive parent to child interactions and improve children's behavioral and emotional skills and abilities. These programs are designed for parents or caregivers with children in a specific age range and can be self-directed or delivered to individual families or groups of families. Some programs have sessions primarily with parents or caregivers, while others include sessions for parents or caregivers, youth, and the family. They teach them with parent-to-child communication and relationships and the youth's interpersonal and problem-solving skills. Next is to lessen harm and prevent future risk. This can include postvention and safe reporting and messaging about suicide. Postvention approaches are implemented after a suicide has taken place. This may include debriefing sessions, counseling, and bereavement or support groups for surviving friends, family members, and other close contacts. These programs reduce survivor's guilt, feelings of depression, and complicated grief about the safe reporting and messaging about suicide. The manner in which an information 
on a recent suicide is communicated to the public via school assemblies, mass media, or social media can heighten the risk of suicide among vulnerable individuals and can contribute to a suicide contagion. Reports that are inclusive of suicide prevention messages, stories of hope, resilience, risk and protective factors, and links to helping resources, and that avoid sensationalizing events or reducing suicide to one cause can help reduce the likelihood of suicide contagion. So now let's debunk some myths about suicide. First myth is that suicide only affects individuals with a mental health condition. This is wrong, as many individuals with mental illness are not affected by suicidal thoughts, and not all people who attempt or die by suicide have mental illness. Once an individual is suicidal, he or she will always remain suicidal. This is also wrong. Active suicidal ideation is often short-term and situation-specific. Third, people who die by suicide are selfish and take the easy way out. Again, this is a myth. People do not, do not die by suicide because they, don't, they do not want to live. People die by suicide because they want to end their suffering. Fourth myth is that talking about suicide will lead to and encourage suicide. The fact is that talking about suicide may reduce suicidal ideation. It improves mental health related outcomes and the likelihood that the person would seek treatment. Fifth myth is that most suicides happen suddenly and without warning. However, warning signs verbally or behaviorally pre precede most suicides, according to research. The last myth is that suicide cannot be prevented. This is not true. Suicide is preventable, but it is just only unpredictable. So what we could do is to give them hope. We want to start the conversation. We will help build up trust between each other. We also need to help bust the stigma about suicide, depression, and mental issues so people begin talking about suicide. With this, they can ask for help and help can be given to them. So the closing statement is that it's not the end of the world if someone is suicidal. Suicide is preventable. Thank you for listening. That will be all for today.